Good afternoon, people. My name is David Thorburn. I'm the director of the MIT Communications Forum and a professor of literature. It's my privilege to uh, introduce today's panel. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> before I do that, I'd like to uh, simply remind everyone in the audience that we are embarking this semester on a very exciting series of forums and a, uh, as well as a conference in April. Uh, the events uh, of the forum are listed uh, on the Communications Forum website. Uh, this is the home page which you're looking at now. If there's anyone in the audience who hasn't signed up at the, at the uh, Communications Forum website for notices about our events, I urge you to do so. We're very, we guard our e email list very jealously. It is, uh, I don't say it never happens, but it almost never happens that you will receive a message from the Communications Forum that isn't about a Communications Forum event. And there are only a few of those, so we don't clog your mailbox. The few exceptions have to do with events that are so relevant to our mission that we feel our audience should be informed about them, and they're always very brief messages. So you run no risk if you sign up and you'll have the benefit of getting advance notice about various uh, projects and uh, uh, events that we sponsor. Uh, I'm especially uh, excited and, and uh, uh, curious about today's forum, which uh, it seems to me to present uh, a kind of ideal mix of, of, of speakers, as you'll see, and, and the topic, as you'll discover, if you don't already realize it, has, uh, it has always been an important topic, uh, but it's become, a, 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 I think, a central one for our society and our politics in recent years. I'm going to say something very briefly about each of the speakers and about the moderator, and then turn things over to the moderator, Professor Jenkins. <clears throat> Joanna Blakely, sitting closest to me on the, oh, here, uh, is the deputy director of the Norman Lear Center, where she performs research on celebrity culture, global entertainment, and digital technology. She lectures on many aspects of media and, enter and the entertainment industry, and has held a range of jobs in high, t in, in, in high tech firms, in, uh, a, a range of high tech jobs, including such positions as web producer, website reviewer, digital archivist, research librarian. She's a universal genius, it seems. Uh, but don't be too happy. That's what they say about Conrad's Kurtz as well, so it's, it may not be so flat. Um, in the middle, David Carr, who is a columnist uh, for the uh, New York Times, uh, writes, uh, his column appears every Monday, and uh, is, it's quite remarkable, I think, what a range of materials in recent years Carr has shown himself to be uh, competent to write about and even a specialist in, uh, a whole range of things having to do with popular culture and, and celebrity culture. As you may know, he's been, he is the carpetbagger for the Times. That is to say, that's his alias as the person who follows the Oscars, and he's, he's just detoxifying, I think, from that uh, uh, very demanding experience. And he's had this horrible task of having to interview celebrities for the last few weeks. I feel very sorry for him about that. Um, uh, Carr, one of Carr's preoccupations uh, is one that I especially share, and that the forum has looked at from time to time, it is the fate of newspapers and the apparent uh, uh, disappearance of, of, of the newspaper as a, uh, as a central force in American society, or the possible disappearance of it, or the migration of some of our best newspapers to what will in the long term almost certainly be an identity only on the World Wide Web. Uh, and this is a matter to which he's devoted a lot of attention in his columns, and if there's an opportunity in the question period, some of you may want to ask him about that. Uh, David Carr is also the author of a very courageous recent memoir that has been uh, justly uh, admired by the reviewers, a, 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 a book called Night of the Gun, a, a personal and very revealing memoir that I urge all of you to read. Stephen Duncombe, furthest from me, teaches history and, polit and the politics of media and culture at NYU. And in recent years, his work has become among the most often cited by students of di popular and digital culture. Among his books are two especially influential titles, uh, two influential titles, Notes from the Underground, Zines and the Politics of Alternative Culture, and most recently, a book entitled Dream, Reimagining Progressive Politics in an Age of Fantasy. He writes a blog 
at the realitysandwich.com site. Finally, I want to uh, uh, introduce and say a few words about my friend and colleague, Henry Jenkins. When I saw him this afternoon, I hadn't seen him in about a week, and uh, I, I was, uh, the sight of him um, uh, filled me with dismay and lamentation, not because there's anything about Henry that should cause dismay, but because I realized looking at him that this was his last semester at MIT. And uh, I, I'm sure that there will be many uh, uh, folks who share my feelings about what a, an astonishing resource for the Institute Henry Jenkins has been. But I wanted to take this opportunity to mention that in his 20 years here, he spent 20 years at MIT, I've never seen a faculty member in, in my more than, more than 40 years in the profession who had a larger impact on a wider range of activities connected to his institution than Henry Jenkins. As some of you know, he's a very distinguished scholar, the author of a number of influential and seminal books, including most recently, Convergence Culture, Where Old and New Media Collide, a book that has been influential in Hollywood as well as among in the scholarly community, and has even, effect, even begun, I think, to affect programming in certain ways. He is also a, a, a teacher of immense gifts and is one of, one, of, one of MIT's most admired teachers. He's also been a head, for a long time now, been a headmaster of one of our uh, undergraduate, uh, um, I don't know, what should we call them, dormitories, colleges. Uh, and uh, in that capacity has affected undergraduate life even more deeply and fully than, than a, a normal teacher would do. In addition to that, of course, he is the genius behind the graduate program in comparative media studies, and probably half the people in this room have been directly and beneficially affected by Henry Jenkins' ideas, by his generosity, by his powers as a teacher and a thinker. Uh, I, I wanted to take this opportunity, and it's long, we, we still have some months, thank goodness, before we actually have to say farewell, but I wanted to uh, uh, signal my sense that when Henry Jenkins leaves MIT, a gap, uh, a gaping abyss will be created that no single professor will ever be able to fill. Henry is currently the Peter de Florence Professor of Humanities at MIT, and as you know, the found, and most of you know, the founder and director of the graduate program in comparative media studies that was launched in 1999. He will leave MIT this summer to go to USC, and that's why lamentations should be modified, qualified, because clearly Henry's going to what is a very wonderful and exciting job, and I'm sure he'll be able to continue his good work there. Uh, at USC, he will hold a joint appointment in the Annenberg School for Communication and the School of Cinema, and in the School of Cinema Arts, and he his um, uh, appoint uh, he he. he I'm, I'm looking here to see the list, the, the name. He, he, he will become what is called the Provost's Professor of Communications at USC, a distinguished uh, endowed chair. With, uh, with that, let me introduce Henry and let him take over the event. Henry. Ooh, after an introduction like that, it's a little hard to know <laughs> how to sink back into the role of the moderator. But uh, I'm delighted to, to be joining you today. And I thank David for the warm introductions to a panel that I've been deeply looking forward to. Uh, what I'd ask is each of the speakers just introduce themselves a little bit further and describe their relationship to the topic. And then we're going to have a back and forth exchange. I've mapped out some questions for them in advance, which will go for, we'll go for about an hour in that mode and then open up the floor to you guys to ask hopefully equally smart and perceptive questions. Uh, we're moving toward a more participatory culture and we welcome your participation. So that, that said, uh, fittingly I guess, I moved from an MIT speaker to a USC speaker and asked Joanna to uh, start things off. Sure. Um, I must say we're gloating at USC to have Henry Jenkins coming our way. Like who are the fools who let this man go? <laughs> We tend to cherry pick from all around the country and around the world, and so it's one reason I'm really excited to be there. Um, I'm especially excited about the center uh, within which I work. It's called the Norman Lear Center. It's based at the Annenberg <laughs> School, 
and it's very unique. Um, it's, it's an academic unit. We have academics, we have a lot of faculty involved with us, we have students working there, but we don't teach classes. We put together really sort of entrepreneurial projects that try to improve media, improve entertainment, and sometimes use entertainment for educational purposes. Also, um, we're activists. We're trying to find ways in order to harness the power of entertainment in order to do something good for the country, for the world. Um, we have a few projects like that. I can talk about them a little later. But one of the things that I think we're most famous for at the Lear Center is our understanding, our commentary, our research projects on the intersection between politics and entertainment. Um, I don't think I have to convince anybody that there's an intersection. <laughs> I think some people think it's the worst thing that's ever happened to public discourse and civil society. Um, other people see how maybe we can take advantage of that intersection in one way or another. Regardless, we have to understand it. It's, it's a very powerful sort of convergence. Um, there's a lot of anecdotal information about it everywhere in every imaginable discipline, throughout the newspapers, um, you know, in the media. But very few people have good research on it. Just exactly in what way does entertainment affect politics? In what way does uh, a person's political preferences, for instance, affect the way they become an audience for some sort of entertainment content? These were the kinds of questions that we were trying to answer, or at least start to address with a survey. Um, it's called the Zogby Lear Center Politics and Entertainment Survey. And I have some slides and some data that I'll share with you about that um, pretty soon. Okay, David, um, pull up your slides. The, uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, David, I just wanted to mention in terms of my duty covering the Oscars and your pity that you showed toward me. Um, I spent time talking to Mickey Rourke and yes, Kate Winslet and the kids from Slumdog and I don't know that it was any more boring or less enlightening than say your last faculty seminar. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's not terrible duty. We're here because the Venn diagram of popular culture and political culture has become a circle. And I thought, I was watching the State of the Union the other night and um, there were congressmen twittering the events, and I thought three things. I think Congress has been twittering a long time before it's been a verb. Um, secondarily, if it was my congressman, I'd rather have him listening than twittering. I don't need him annotating um, what's in plain sight to me. I don't, I, I don't really need to see his little thought bubbles about this. And third is, Everybody's watching this is probably surprised except Henry. Henry totally saw this <coughs> coming. I think we saw it in the last election. Uh, um, an intersect, let's just keep, go to the next one, Henry. I love that I get to order Henry around. It's good, the only time in my life. Um, one of the things that I want to talk about is I'm going to stand up because uh, I'm self-important and because I can't see. Um, what, what the Obama guys worked out is we'll give you access to our events, to our list. All we want is your information. That's all we want. And that's, that's a commercial imperative over and over. Free is always in exchange for your data. I think of like the text uh, messaging of the vice president. You know, all the mainstream media said, oh, it's a complete failure. We found out. What did they gather? Four million names off that. How much money do you think they pulled out of those people? And I think we have to acknowledge that friends is more important than supporters. If you think of 2.5 million Facebook friends, that is a much more, because of network effects, because you have a deeper knowledge of who they are. Um, even the nomenclature that they overlaid when they say my bow, that implies a kind of custody and a personal relationship and um, I think what was what was cool is they raised more money by an order of magnitude than ever, but then they spent it in very traditional ways. And I, I don't know that it'll be that way the next time around, but you know they spent over $250 million on network ads. So it was money harvested on one platform was then, then uh, spent on another. And I think as you guys look towards 2012, you have to look at the spend side. The harvest 
is is writ. You you want to keep rolling? Yep. We, uh, one thing I want to say about that is if you look at they started with the database, they made it into a base. Now they're at the White House. They don't just have a base; they have a database. And you see the first big hurdle that Obama comes up against. If he's having a battle with newspapers like mine, he's going to be able to go around, communicate with the, his guys, and say, you know what, they're not getting that right. You have to look and think to yourself, what was going on in 04? No YouTube. Facebook was just across the street. That was it. No HuffPo. Um, part of what happened, and this just amazed me, was the campaign put out 70 of their, video, 70 of their own videos, and they had access that we could not obtain. They did something called Four Days in Denver that showed Obama warming up, Obama with the family, and any network would have killed, killed, killed to have that kind of access. So they have leverage that we as coverers do not. The other thing, I, I, I think people say, well, you know, it's on the web, unless it's, you know, grandma getting tasered out of a tree and falling on a trampoline, nobody's gonna watch it. What was the biggest video for the Obama campaign? It was a 37 minute unannotated lecture on race. So it depends on what you're uh, talking about. One, I went to both conventions, 15,000 media members, but you walk in to say where the LA Times, Chicago Tribune, the Tribune Co used to be, no footprint at all, nothing. Whereas Politico had 40 people, Slade had 11 people, uh, Daily Kos had, had 10 people. So the number of reporters didn't change, but their, their identity and approach most certainly did. One of the things that happened there was Katie Couric, who's been in prison behind an anchor desk and has not been doing big numbers, left the anchor desk, went gorilla with a camera, adopted the tools of the insurgency, and in, in doing so came up with great coverage, rehabilitated her career. My seminal moment at the Democratic Convention is I was talking to Craig Newmark of Craigslist. I was standing there talking to him and realized the kid just to my right was live blogging our conversation. I thought, you know what, it doesn't get any more meta than this. It's Craig and I are talking to each other and this guy's writing about it. Let's see what else I got here. Do you guys know who Mayhill Fowler is? She more or less tilted the ranks. She was a citizen journalist for the HuffPo and she came up with the bitter remarks that almost knocked uh, Obama off stride. And, and I saw her afterwards and I said, well, what do we take away? And she says, there's gonna be a lot more of me in 2012 presents a kind of asymmetry that I think campaigns are gonna to have to deal with. The, um, the, the, the miracle of that campaign was just to watch an, watch an organism organize itself. They created a template, and so <clears throat> things like phone banking, which is a goddamn nightmare for every national campaign, self-organized. People took 10 names off the list, they were able to take what they wanted and, 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 and leave it there without a significant management and oversight from the campaign. You had a lot of blended media, not just from CNN. I was there with a lot of video. And CNN was grabbing citizen video from wherever they went. And one of the things that happened, I think, early on is, is it became a kind of style thing or a <laughs> an expression of who you are. And you didn't call somebody and say, we need your support, we need your vote. You said, hey, have you seen this video by Will I Am? Let me send it to you, it's out there, it's ready. I think I got, um, <laughs> one thing I wanna just talk about is, 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 is the fact that what it meant to be a supporter of Obama went beyond your political identity you, you, you could be a fan of Saturday Night Live, which made you a fan of uh, Tina Fey, who I saw last week, who looks a lot to me like Sarah Palin. And that was an expression of your cultural identity that became part of your political identity. Certain memes would develop. I mean, when I was at the convention, I heard her say snow machine. You know, I knew she was gonna be kind of driving her own path to the American public in the same way. And it didn't, once they created these images, and I think Henry has done wonderful work with this way, they lost custody of them. So Joe the Plumber was one thing, but Joe the Plumber became a million other things mashed up in whatever way people wanted to their own ends. 
And whatever campaign's put out there, they should know that it's going to be used and, and annotated. Um, do I have one more or two more, Henry? Uh, oh, you know what? This is, this is a cool... This, uh, um, this is a cool quote that Rahm Emanuel made this uh, comment about now, now he's the chief of staff. But I thought it was a really smart thing to say about how the media is operating because I, what we were all wandering around. The, the, the way the conventions historically had done is all the big papers would come in at 10 o'clock, sort of scratch their bellies, drink some coffee, and say, what are we going to do? No more. For one thing, we were all up at 7 in the morning. We were all too busy making media to consume any media. We were running around uh, um, um, uh, with a, like a chicken with our head just cut off. And as I watched this apparatus of citizen-generated content, uh, YouTube videos used to their own ends mashed up, I thought, this is amazing that you could make. It feels niche, but it's acting mass. And what a great tool for marketing. What a great tool for democracy. Or if you're so inclined, what a great tool for fascists as well. So I do think that it's not all gooey and, and, and wonderful. Um, one more, and then I'm going to sit down. You know what? I'm just going to talk about one, one thing, actually, is, is the miracle of the... Uh, you can lose the slides, Henry. That's, that's, I was on the Acela on the way up, so I was having these like big long thoughts and I wrote long. Um, you had Obama girl, which is one kind of expression and then you had Derek Eshong who was a hip hop guy who got captured making an impassioned plea on behalf of Obama in just a video that went viral. Obama girl didn't vote according to news reports. The miracle, the miracle of, of and the reason that the youth vote made an impact it's not what they did, not the activity but, uh, that they did online. It's what they did offline. They went and voted. And when we look back, I think it's going to be what we're going to look at is not how they raise the money or how they get so many people engaged. It's how did they take that behavior and make it work offline. And they did it by making voting seem like something that was cool. Henry and others have pointed out, I mean, I'm just coming out of the Oscars where the polls and the participation are endless. We all I, you know, pull up to the American Idol with the expectation that we're going to play a role. And if we just watch for sure the greatest, greatest drama in recent American democracy, we would expect at the end, as a citizenry, as a culture, to have an opportunity to say, I like that guy. It's, just, it's now baked into the process. And I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking. OK, Steve, sure. Um, there's a moment uh, from the recent presidential campaign which is, has stayed with me. Um, and I'm going to ask Henry to, this is something I pulled off the web so the, the titles aren't mine. But I understand that because that's the textbook Washington game. That's how our politics has been taught to be played. That's the lesson that she learned when the Republicans were doing that same thing to her back in the 1990s. So I understand it, and when you're running for the presidency, uh, then you've got to expect it. Uh, and, you know, you've just got to kind of play it. All right, uh, you know, it was a brilliant move uh, by Barack Obama. He had just gotten beaten up, um, actually, and this was his comeback after um, a, a, a bruising debate. And it, and it was a brilliant move for a number of reasons. One is um, it signaled that he could rise above criticism and separate himself from the politics as usual, and he used it as a rhetorical strategy to do that. It signified that he understood and appreciated popular culture, particularly youth culture. It's a great moment if you, get the, if you see it from a wider angle of who stands up first. You know, it's all these young people, and then the older folks are like, well, okay, I'm going to stand up as well. I, I guess this is good. I don't know what that means, but it means something. Um, uh, it also distanced himself from his opponents on a cultural level. That is, Hillary Clinton 
who had held press conferences and hearings condemning popular youth culture like Grand Theft Auto, um, but also presidents past. I mean, think about the use of, for example, rap music by um, Hillary Clinton's husband um, and sister soldier during the campaign um, that Bill Clinton was running, in which he demonized it and it was a way to distance himself from popular culture. Um, it also was brilliant because it then got as Henry well knows, it got remixed, mashed up, went viral, and reproduced. When I typed in for Google to pull this down, I could have picked from one of any hundreds of different versions of this. Um, it also reminded us just how unbelievably cool Barack Obama is. Um, and uh, the moment really stayed with me. Um, and it also got me thinking a lot about the relationship between politics and popular culture, and how it's shifting, and also how I think Politicos, which one thing that's left out of my bio is I've been an activist since I was 17, is how politicos can start to think about popular culture um, in a productive way. Traditionally, there's been two ways for um, politicos to think about uh, popular culture. Um, one is the, uh, the pessimistic line. And the pessimistic line, whether it's liberal or conservative, goes something like this. Popular culture is, at best, a distraction from politics, and at worst, it's a contagion to be quarantined inoculated from media literacy and eradicated. Um, like the circuses of Imperial Rome, popular culture distracts us from the sorts of thinking and reasoning necessary for an informed populace in a democracy. Um, in other words, we're watching American Idol when we should be reading foreign affairs. Um, worse, the values expressed in popular culture, and for those on the left, it's materialism, consumerism, racism, and sexism. Um, for the right, it's hedonism, immorality, and irreligiosity. These values infect the public mind, making any sort of moral political community impossible. Worse still, as political thinkers since Plato and Aristotle have complained, pop culture speaks to the emotions, the heart and the gut, or maybe a bit lower, whether it be Homer or wind instruments or rap music, um, whereas politics ought to be a rational affair of the sober mind. So that's kind of one, one approach. The other approach is sort of the exact opposite, which is the, the populist approach. And this approach um, is the uncritical <coughs> celebration of pop culture as popular politics. This is more traditionally thought of in terms of things like folk cultures, uh, the voice of the people, or subcultures, you know, punk rock is proto-revolutionary formation, which I think I argued in a book once. Um, but in any case, this perspective makes its way out to the wider world as well. Um, for conservatives, therefore, NASCAR is, becomes the very expression of certain rugged individualism um, tied with a superior industrial can-do. Or for liberals, I don't know, something like world music um, becomes uh, a popular articulation of people's appreciation for diversity and global unity. Regardless of political persuasion, pop culture in itself is a fully constituted expression of popular will from this perspective. And at its most, express, at its most extreme, this sort of cultural populism substitutes culture for politics. In other words, politics kind of drops off and only culture is the thing which is examined. So watching American Idol is democracy. It doesn't lead to democracy, doesn't converge with democracy, but actually is a replacement for democracy and that's something to be celebrated. But I want to offer another model um, for thinking about the relationship between pop culture and politics. And that's um, what, on the, Estella, on the way up, um, I came up with mobilization, but we could probably come up with a better, a better word. Um, and my thinking, eh, yeah, it's, it's, my thinking uh, has been really heavily influenced in this by two thinkers. One, Antonio Gramsci, who was an Italian communist who died in Mussolini's jails. And the other is Stuart Hall, who is a West Indian British academic who's a still alive and well. Um, and uh, although he, he recently retired from the Open University in the UK. What they did was, I think, really valuable. I could have added Walter Lippmann in there, the young Walter Lippmann, but I'll just take those two. Um, what they did is they turned their concern away from whether or not popular culture is political or anti-political in itself, but reframed the question in what I think is a very useful way, which is how can be, how can and how is pop culture used politically? That is, how is culture mobilized in the service of politics? Now, this mobilization can be practiced in a pretty superficial level. That is, Obama referencing pop culture in a political speech. Um, but it also can be practiced in a much more extensive and, I think, productive manner, which I'm just going to kind of throw out some ideas now. We can follow up later if we want. Um, because as the populists understand, popular culture expresses popular ideals, desires, and dreams, and sometimes nightmares. And in this way, popular culture is remarkably utopian. I remember John Stewart uh, joking before Obama was our president. Um, he said, well, how do you know when the drama you're watching is set in the future? 
because we have a black president. Okay, and so his question is, what happens if we really get a black president? It will be in the future. Um, but in any case, it's the, it, it is, he, what he was nailing was the utopian element of popular culture. But as pessimists argue, pop culture isn't politics, it's an idealization and a fantasy. What I want to argue is it's exactly the fantasy element of popular culture, it's sort of phantasmagoric element, which makes pop culture so useful to politics. That is, pop culture, is a really unique laboratory of popular fantasy that can be explored, understood, mobilized, and then actualized through political practice. Now this isn't easy, and it's not sort of a blanket application that one can do, because popular culture is shot through with all sorts of contradictory messages and desires. I mean, Grand Theft Auto, for example, is a misogynistic, hyperviolent fantasy, but it's also a dream of autonomy and control. Or celebrity media acknowledges adulation of an aristocracy of the image, but it also acknowledges our profound desire to be seen and recognized, that is, not to be invisible in our world. Every McDonald's advertisement, for example, um, wrapped up in sort of this bad eating habits being pushed upon us, is also an image of idyllic community life. In each case, there's a utopian element, a dream of what a better world could be. Then, and I think this is why pop culture, at least to me, matters politically, because pop culture is this great, fabulous, wide open repository of popular fantasy. And I think it's the job of politics, in a way, to actually look at these fantasies and make them reality. I'll just stop there. Okay. So we have some interesting opening provocations. Uh, I, th I think one place we clearly want to start our discussion is around the figure of Obama. You, two of you have already spoken fairly explicitly about Obama. Uh, on your on, David, on your slide, you had the phrase Obama as a brand, and I think that might be a productive way to think about the campaign. You know, in what way was Obama a brand? And arguably, he was not a television candidate. He was not a digital candidate as a brand. He's a transmedia candidate who spreads his message across every available media platform. And I know you were focusing on that during the campaign and wrote some really interesting stuff about it. So yeah, if, if, if I were a marketer, I would look at the, the sort of, they began with an ideal and just only the, the substance and, and meat of who he was accreted only very slowly and was, was, uh, was brought together. So you had, I mean, you, you obviously start with, um, you know, a lot of people said uh, Barack Hussein Obama, not the best name to run for pr U.S. president with. But that word Obama, its roundness, its fullness, its sort of distinction, it, it led to something called Obamaism, where it became a source of not just political identity, but cultural identity. And so when you, um, when you said you were for Obama, it said a couple things about you. I'm ready for the future. I'm ready for this time when our, we're going to have a president and he's going to happen to be black. And the other thing that sort of said about you is I'm down. I know what this means. I know what he's talking about. And I think there's been this. Given what has happened, and I'm, I'm a reporter, so I'm a moral and ethical eunuch and have no political beliefs that you'll ever discern, but um, I do think that there was a palpable hunger among people. We've seen what sort of the crusty old white guys could do, and <clears throat> I think it was yes, less about race and more about young, and everything he did where he demonstrated, I mean, he, what was his big concern once he won? Can I keep my BlackBerry? Can I keep it? And then when they came up with this amazing BlackBerry that, that he could keep something I think a few, more than a few of us could shamefully identify with, they asked him about it. He said, oh, yeah, you push a button on this, and it turns into an automobile. And, and you push a button on this, and it defends the free world. And you go, you know what? I like that guy. He's funny. That makes me... Um, and what we did, what he did is he had a trade dress as a popular culture uh, figure. And admittedly, you know, sort of Hollywood and Will I Am and everybody gathered around and gave him a halo effect. But he's the first guy um, that um, uh, um, understood. I, I mean, when he was really thinking about 
how can I take something little and make it big? Who did he go and see Mark Andreessen, you know, and said, what is it about, you know, politicians are all uh, interested in that interweb, you know, we gotta, you know, let, you got one guy who can't use uh, email and the other guy who understands that it is, and I, Henry has taught the illusion of the black box that you could just pull up to this thing. No, it's, he was smart enough to say, I have a very small brand. It hasn't been dented. How can I make it go viral using a, con a variety of platforms and a convergent culture to both create funding for further uh, advertising, but also to create and, and access network effects to build my brand into something robust and mighty that might be leave parties a little beside the point that might not make the New York Times as important as they once were and to kind of cut his own path to brand building, so. So I wanted to extend this to Steve and think a little bit about the, the utopian side of it. And I, I keep thinking about the Shepard Farley graphic, yeah. you know, with hope underneath it here in Boston. Shepard Farley's doing an exhibit at the Institute of Contemporary Art, no doubt probably <laughs> bubbled up and got as arrested. a result of that graphic, <laughs> you know. But this is the guy who was an original guerrilla graffiti guy. You've seen Andre the, Posse, Andre the Giant's got a posse underneath the bridges, but that hope icon, you know, really speaks to that role of fantasy. Yeah. I mean, there, there's two ways to read that. One is the very cynical way, which is, you know, again, this is uh, what Walter Lippmann's writing about in 1923, uh, how <laughs> politics works is you float this sort of empty symbol, um, be it patriotism or be it hope, and then everybody attaches, everybody in the populace, attaches their own particular and very heartfelt emotions to that. What might be hope for you, might be different for you, might be different for you, but we can all agree on hope. Um, and then you sort of trundle that out. And that's the sort of cynical manufacture of consent that Walter Lippmann was talking about in 1923. But I also think that yeah, it does work cynically, but somehow Obama was able to, um, I don't know how to describe this, but not betray the individual interest with his generalized hope and uh, kind of allow and become this almost empty, and this is why the brand is actually a very good way of describing him, the sort of empty thing of which we could all just apply what we wanted to to him, but at the same time not come across as fake and empty and cloying. Um, one of the things that I think he did really well is that he read that there's lots of types of popular culture out there and lots of types of ideals out there. And that the Democrats for years and years and years have basically read popular culture as the way the right has wanted them to see popular culture. That is, country and western is popular, rap music and alternative music is somehow elitist um, or urban or something of that nature. Um, and what was fascinating about Obama is he just went out and said, you know, you know I'm a mixed race, latte sipping, urban, uh, guy who likes basketball and uh, and uh, hip hop and um, finishes my speeches with the big country yeah, western song. Yeah, I know he did well, but he's not, he's not stupid <laughs> because it is a big tent out there. Yes, okay, yes. but a lot of the you know a lot of people listen to country western also listen to hip hop. But one of the things that's interesting is he he was able to say, look that there's actually a sort of competition of culture out there in a lot of ways. And you can actually align yourself with this other thing, which is just as popular and has crossovers into what is considered the real American culture or, you know, a, a culture of real American people and so on. So, Joanna, the research you've been doing is all about this competition of culture and how it relates to political taste. Yes, I, I would just add uh, with the Obama discussion here that it was very interesting to see a certain popular cultural literacy play out in the campaigns. Um, it can be very dangerous for political campaigns to utilize celebrities yeah. and to engage in popular music. You, it's so easy to make a misstep. And Obama rarely did. And uh, McCain desperately tried to actually make Obama look bad for being so in sync with popular culture and being so popular, right? He made that uh, ad that featured Paris Hilton, and it, it totally ended up biting him on the ass. And Paris Hilton ended up coming up with a great viral video that made her look a lot smarter than anybody thought she was. <laughs> and so it, it's she a very... She really is stupid. <laughs> <laughs> but she's really stupid. It was good writing, but I heard she, mem she memorized what she said. Um, it was her energy policy. Um, but but it's, it's, it's just interesting to, to watch, and it was something that I was, I was looking at very closely in this campaign because um, 
popular culture, celebrity, these things are tools, they're weapons, <laughs> they can backfire. So, so do you want me to yeah, talk I'll about the Zogby survey? Down, so. Oh yeah, oh, oh yeah. I'll take this so I can see what's up here. Does this pop out Just easy? pull it straight out, like. I'll take yours. <laughs> I'll silence you. Okay, I just put I just put this slide in here for fun. You know, politics, popular culture, yeah. Okay, you can move to the next one. Um, we did the survey uh, with Zogby International, and uh, I think it was a really smart survey because what we what we decided is that it doesn't really uh, do you much good to ask people what their political ideology is. <laughs> You can ask a political scientist what their political ideology is, and they might be able to have some sort of coherent response for you. But generally, people just have a lot of very deep feelings about a lot of complicated issues, but they don't necessarily know how to articulate what that adds up to, what they are as a political being. And so we developed a very sophisticated political typology as part of this survey. It was 42 statements about all of the really scary issues that you can imagine we were asking about. Environmentalism, abortion, uh, diplomacy, the wars, uh, military action, all the kinds of things that are hot, and but hot button issues in American politics. And we did a statistical analysis of the way in which people responded to, uh, uh, to those questions. And we checked to see whether there were any groups that emerged. We wanted to see if there were cohorts in America that sort of held together by the way in which they responded to these uh, questions, these statements. We didn't care what they called themselves. They could call themselves libertarian. They could say they were registered Democrats. We asked them that stuff in another section of the survey, but we didn't care what they said. We just wanted to see where they might fall on some sort of continuum. We didn't care how many groups would come out of it. When we did the statistical analysis, the, the tightest clusters were when we had three groups. The largest group, which sounded conservative to us in terms of the way they responded to, the, to these uh, uh, political questions, we called the red group. Uh, the second largest group, we called the blue group. They, they sounded very liberal in the way they responded to these issues. And then there was a very murky middle group. It was about 24% of the country. This was a national American survey, 3,200 uh, surveyed. Um, and we called them purples because they had these sort of shared values between the reds and the blues. It was very hard to figure out who they were. Very interesting group. And then the same set of people that we diagnosed their uh, politics, we asked them hundreds of questions about entertainment. What kind of music do you like? What kind of movies did you go see this last summer? What's your favorite TV show? When you have spare time, what do you like to do? Do you like to read books? Do you like to surf the web? What kind of game franchises are your favorite ones? Lots and lots and lots of questions like this. And also a few questions where we asked them what they thought about the convergence between entertainment and politics. So we found these political clusters that were very significant. This is the red cluster, and I wanted to just get that slide up there so you could take a look at some of the entertainment preferences among that group. And we checked to see there was, if there were also a strong correlation between the political groups and a particular way of consuming entertainment. And it turned out there was. Um, the shocking thing is that there were so few overlaps among the three groups that uh, what we were finding were these sort of entertainment and media ghettos, uh, where if you fell into the blue group, you most likely hated most of the entertainment preferences of the red group, and vice versa. If you liked a certain television genre best, um, you most likely belonged to one group and not another. That was probably the genre that you didn't like. So it was, it was very distressing, actually, because one of the main reasons I wanted to put this survey together was to find cultural touchstones, you know, th entertainment products out there that bring people together across ideological divides. Uh, they weren't there. I was shocked. Um, uh, House was one of the few cultural... <laughs> Yeah, why, why? <laughs> Equally favored among purples, reds, and blues, and also across almost every single demographic tab, and we had just about every tab that you can imagine. Race, gender, sex, where you live in the country, what kind of citizen you think you are. They all like house. But there were so few of those that um, it was quite distressing, actually, to me. But it made for good press releases. Um, I've just taken out the portion of the data today about entertainment preferences, since we're really talking about the relationship between politics and entertainment. 
And here are a few of the red entertainment preferences. Let's go to the next slide. Um, purples were very, very interesting. These were people who actually consume a lot more entertainment than the other two groups. They tend to watch just about everything on primetime television. These are their favorite shows, Law and Order, 60 Minutes, and CSI. A conservative, a person in the red group, wouldn't be caught dead watching 60 Minutes. They really like reality programming, or at least they're the only group that's willing to admit it. <laughs> they love the Wii and Super Mario Kart and Dance Dance Revolution. We thought this was really great, but we had also asked them a question about whether they ever enjoy entertainment that was made outside of the United States, and they said never. <laughs> so it was very interesting that there was this sort of um, unwillingness to admit or this reluctance to believe that they could actually enjoy something that wasn't created in their own country. Um, go ahead to the next slide. Now blues, you'll see I have a lot more preferences listed on this slide, and partly that's because of the limitations of the survey. Um, I was very rigorous about only selecting entertainment content that was most popular, right? The most, the best-selling game franchises, the most popular shows from the most recent Nielsen ratings I could find, the biggest blockbusters. I wanted to make sure that we were asking about the entertainment that the most number of people had most likely seen or heard of. Um, it turns out that a lot of the most popular popular culture in this country is quite appealing to blues. Reds don't like much of it at all. If I had been able to include in our survey questions about niche entertainment, uh, the golf network, you know, all those places that the Republican National Committee decided that they need to advertise their candidates, I would probably get a lot more entertainment preferences for Reds. So this was very revealing in and of itself, that um, when we're looking at the most popular popular culture, we are looking at a culture that is preferred by one political group over another. Okay, next slide. Um, this was something that Henry picked up on in one of his blog entries on his site, and it was my favorite part of the survey, really, um, where I got to ask questions about what they thought about this convergence between entertainment and politics. How often do you find yourself enjoying entertainment that reflects values other than your own? Now, 26% of Reds, that's one in four of them, said they never find themselves enjoying entertainment that doesn't reflect their values. This was on a Likert scale. I mean, you didn't have to choose never. <laughs> and only 9% of purples and 10% of blues agreed. Then we asked, do you find yourself entertained by things that you believe are in bad taste? 45% of Reds, almost one in two Reds, said they never find themselves entertained by things that they believe are in bad taste. And only 21% of Blues and 36% of Purples agreed with, with that statement, that they never find themselves entertained by something in bad taste. And this was a really key sort of um, data point. Because it's not just that we're arguing that if people like certain representations, then it's because those rep representations reflect their politics, reflect their life, reflect what they think the world should be about. Not at all. Actually, there's an entire uh, sort of audience that, that's hungry for representations that are foreign, that are unfamiliar, that are horrible, that are examples of what not to do. And this is a very different sort of relationship to representations than, than other groups have. Next slide. We asked them whether they thought that you could find political messages in fictional TV shows and movies. And the full question was much more belabored. It was like setting aside news, setting aside documentaries, setting aside talk shows. Do you think this stuff contains political messages? And a very large majority said absolutely. So there's not some sensibility among the American public that, oh, popular culture, that's, that's, that's not political. No, it is. And the next one? One thing that we're very curious about at the Lear Center is whether people learn from fictional representations. We have a huge project. It's funded by the Centers for Disease Control to get accurate health information into TV shows because the CDC has found, lo and behold, they were horrified to find this out. People watch primetime TV, they believe it. There's no doctor on staff. Those facts aren't necessarily checked. 
So they give us money to try to make sure, to try to pressure, cajole these television um, producers and writers to actually get it right. So here we ask, how often do you learn about political issues when you watch fictional, fictional TV shows or films? And a majority of the American public said that they do. Next one. I think that might be at the end. Yeah, I just stuck that in for fun. <laughs> okay. So Steve and uh, David, you've both been paying close attention to this. It's, I would be curious to get your reactions to what its implications might be for your, your approaches. Can I just jump in? Okay. you actually say it, I want to be able to say it. Um, something that uh, David said, he said earlier that cultural identity gets, is becoming merged with political identity. And I think what I love about those last sort of um, charts that you throw, threw up there, Joanna, is I think that that's what that speaks to. It's not that people, I'm guessing, that people are finding politics <laughs> in their fictional entertainment. It's what they define as politics is increasingly cultural. That is, who loves who? Um, what sort of things do they enjoy in this fictional world? What sort of attitudes do they have about their neighbors and so on and so forth? Those very things which we wouldn't necessarily have thought of politics or if you look up politics in the Oxford English Dictionary simply don't include. And so I think it's partly about this expansive notion of what we think as political as it starts to, 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 to enter into the cultural realm. I do think that there is... Um, <coughs> <clears throat> Part of the problem that we're having as a culture right now is our, our core expertise is consumption. And so if we don't make stuff but we're good at consuming stuff, consumption begins to be a metric on who we are. And so you had this huge movement that you could somehow, if you went to the better grocery store and spent more <clears throat> money on you, your food, that was a form of voting or political expression. I think in the same way, um, um, if you're willing to admit that you like watching Tom Selleck, that you're sort of making a statement of who you are. We both remarked when we saw a house up there on the, on the, um, on the blues, no, on the reds, is like, well, what is House doing there? He's anti-authoritarian and da, da da But you know what? When it comes to certain maypoles of culture, and this is what the entertainment industry is looking for, is the sweet spot where everybody can find something that they want. And I think a big part of what happened with, uh, with Obama is, is what you talked about, and what you talked about is you had some, a vessel that got filled up with people's aspirations, and it became a cultural marker, which is, I listen, I watch The Daily Show, and I like, um, I mean, I called my daughter early on, who's a, uh, a junior at the uh, University of Wisconsin, and I said, Obama's speaking tomorrow, what do you think? She said, I think he is just going to kill. And I said, why? He said, the biggest nitwit on my floor just came up to me and said, I'm really interested in seeing this Obama guy tomorrow. And so what she was sensing is uh, just as, it, 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 as, as, as a handbag being a marker or a consumption of a show, that this was a way to communicate that you were with it, that you, that you knew what you were doing, and I, I find that you can, um, like the Super Bowl, I had uh, 10, 12 people over, we were talking about the Oscars. People identify over and over, the Oscars were such a great example of people stepping and saying, that is the worst, most appalling thing I have ever seen. They can't get that right, that's terrible. And other people just going, I loved it, it was wonderful. And I do think that we tend to use these iconic large events as a mirror in which we see ourselves or identify ourselves. Can I raise a question? Yeah, sure. And actually, I'd love to, because you probably actually thought about this and putting this together, but is this a bad thing? Oh, is this, is this a bad thing? I mean, exactly what Dave is talking about, which is this sort of the conflation of politics and culture. The idea that a politician can become a brand and sort of an empty brand in which we find ourselves in like we find ourselves in, I'm a Levi's wearer or what have you. 
um, is this the absolute degradation of politics, or is it actually, <laughs> one view, yes. <laughs> the, second, or the second view is, is this how we've learned for better or for worse to express who we are and our identities and our pleasures and our desires, and so actually what we should be looking for is those people that do it with integrity. That is, this is the game, and are you gonna do it well, or are you gonna do it badly? Are you gonna do it with honor or not honor? And stop holding out this idea or idealized sort of enlightenment vision of the rational public, which is going to make you know, decisions based on cold calculation and so on and so forth. Well, the, the risk of uh, using popular culture, the risk of use, using popular culture and celebrity is uh, trivializing something that's otherwise important. Right, that's one thing that gets people so up in arms and you know, they actually shout out from an audience to say, yes, this is a horrible thing. Um, when things are trivialized, important things are trivialized, that's a huge problem. When substance is somehow uh, undermined because you have added some glitz factor, that's a huge problem. But if you are able to suck some extra people into the tent just because you got Bruce Springsteen to perform a song before you spoke, that's probably a good thing. So you have to mobilize this stuff with integrity and with care. And you have to be a brand manager of sorts. You have to figure out what's going to draw the right people in so that they will be open and interested in my message. And your message may be a health message, for instance, like what we do at the Lear Center, or it could be a, com a, a political candidate's message. It can also be you know, a proponent of evolution who's trying to explain to um, you know, a very angry audience about why it is that evolution ought to be taught in that school. Scientists, too need to use the tricks of entertainment and popular culture in order to get people into the tent and to get their message heard. So it's, it's often more of a method than a content, and it can be used in the, in the worst, the most horrible and un, unimaginably bad ways, but it can also be used to be very effective. Yeah, well, let's remember that it's not just a tool of the hip young candidate. What was in 04 and in and, and 2000, what was George Bush really selling? Um, the, uh, um, didn't he win those elections on style points? You, can, you, you, you would never look at him and say, well, there's a Mensa. I want him in charge of the free world. He's got so much throbbing brain power that, <laughs> you, you, but, but you say, you got John Kerry with the gigantic stick up his backside, and then you got this guy who's got his thumbs through his belt loops, who knows how to wear a pair of boots, who can push and brush around, and and it's it's like, who do I want to I identify with? Is it, um, you know, John Kerry wearing those bike shorts and riding a jillion dollar bikes and button in line, or is the guy that knows how to get on a horse and doesn't look stupid when he do it. And you can, you can laugh, but I think if you think back um, to 2000, what a gas bag Al Gore was and how full of himself, that, that style, that popular cultural approach, and he was dealing with memes and, and templates from an earlier era, ones that were frankly outright borrowed from Ronald Reagan, but I think worked for him very well. So it's not... There's, there's a huge part of this that is not new. It's just being, being it's, it's, it's encountering a network effect. And you never know which way it's going because people are up in arms with that slide of those guys fist bumping. It personally brought me an enormous pleasure, both when they did it and when I saw it on the cover of The New Yorker. You just don't know what way things are gonna cut. I wanna bring it back even further um, to 1933. Um, and you know, think about FDR's fireside speech, which is, of course, one of the things that Obama's recent speech has been compared to. And here's FDR using this new medium of radio, and he is thinking about style completely and utterly. And what's interesting about that speech, um, I encourage everybody to go and download it and listen to it, is um, that he doesn't sacrifice substance. In fact, he actually uses style, his rich voice, um, his, his uh, the stuff is actually scripted by um, um, a 
playwright Robert Sherwood, um, but he had um, uh, a couple of poets working for him as well. So it's very stylized speech, but he very plainly describes how the banking system works. And so I think that oftentimes we start thinking about style and substance as you either have one or the other, you either have Al Gore or you have the empty you know, rhetoric of uh, George W. Bush. But actually I think that FDR did both, and I think actually that's, that's what Obama is doing as well, is I think he's actually pulling those two together and we, we don't have to sacrifice one for the other. Can I, can I just ask you a brief question? Yeah. Um, nobody except your red, blues liked anything foreign, but then Slumdog Millionaire just passed 100 million, won the Academy Award. And it, it wasn't just one cohort that pushed that over the top, or was it? You and I both care about the Oscars, so I just <laughs> want to go there for a Well, minute. I must say, I hated Slumdog Millionaire. I was so disappointed in it. I am the only person I know. No. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. I love Danny Boyle. What was he doing with this sentimental schlock? I think it's the sentimentality. It's a great movie. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's the genre work that's oh. taking place there, I think, that, that was really appealing to a very broad audience. I think that there's so many people really do deeply believe that there are universal values and that certain stories can tap into them, like Titanic, for instance. And they, they show you box office numbers and say, see, this kind of story resonates with people who have absolutely no connection to that culture whatsoever. And I think it's very simplistic. I, I, it's simplistic to claim that there must be a universal story since people sometimes respond to the same cultural object. I think it's much more complicated than that. But my presumption is that's what was going on with Slumdog Millionaire. But still, it's quite shocking that it got the Oscar. Yes. Well, pushing in a slightly different direction, the role of comedy in the political discourse of this year is what, probably one of the most yeah. striking features, whether we're talking on Obama Girl on YouTube or Saturday Night Live skewering of Palin or the role of Daily Show in articulating the values of a generation. And it seems to me the discourse of, of comedy is profoundly different as a way of framing political debates than, say, the melodramatic discourse of It's Morning in America, the Daisy Girl, you know, the sort of classic political advertising, which we might think of as propaganda and its deep appeal to sentimentality and emotion. And that cuts directly to what you were just saying about Slumdog. Mm -hmm. So what do we think is, what do we make of the role of comedy in this campaign? Even John McCain with the celebrity cycle was trying for a certain snarky yeah. comedy at Obama's expense. It didn't go over very well, but it was still an attempt to translate the campaign issues into satire rather than to melodrama. I think that um, I think that you're right in that things have changed a great deal because if you think back to I don't know like 88 what was political comedy it was uh, Mike Dukakis in uh, Tank with the helmet on. Um, I'm sorry to keep picking on Massachusetts people, but you guys really aren't from here either. Um, okay, sorry, re represent. You, you've got a lot to answer for. Um, the, the thing is, one of the things that I think has happened, and this is a weird, like, off-kilter thing, funny is hard. Funny is really, really hard. And when you've got this huge... You, you, you've more or less empowered all these people, cheap, ubiquitous video technology to film stuff, cheap, ubiquitous stuff to ma manipulate what, and a lot of what Henry talked about is you've got this ad hocracy out there working. And, <clears throat> you know, a, a while ago it was just, oh, jib jab, that's it. Now you've got every kid with Photoshop with that the, 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 the can do it. And it, it just gets better and better as it goes up the pole. I mean, think of how moribund Saturday Night Live was in the culture when this election started. No one watching it. And they got a puff of oxygen off of this, realized what they had, and wrote it back into the American consciousness. So it wasn't just politicians hitching themselves. There was only one story, trust me, as somebody who writes about other things is there really was only one story. Um, I, had a, I had a book out that came out in August, doing great, doing great, doing great. The nominations came. I didn't even care about my book. No. <laughs> How could you ever 
in, in dramatic terms, in comedic terms, how could you ever have come up with uh, a, a Sarah Palin? You never would have been able to conjure her. I mean, and she piped into women's magazines right away, into all, 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 all sorts of things we hadn't seen before. And the, the quality of political humor in this uh, go round, whether you're talking Colbert or Daily Show or the kid in his basement, I spent a lot of the season just laughing my ass off. It was funny. Yeah. But also interesting was the type of humor, which it was satire and irony. And I think that that's actually, it's a, it's a different type of humor because it's a humor that doesn't tell you what to think. It actually is funny because you have to fill in the blank. That is, it tells you that this is not what, it, whoops, this is not what I'm thinking. This is not what I believe. And then the audience has to figure out that space, that, 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 that place of, ah, this is what the comic really thinks. This is what I really think. And there's a form of a communion there. And I think it's a deeply political type of humor. I mean, this is why Swift was using it, in that it actually does create a community of meaning. Um, because you have to kind of both come up with the punchline which isn't there, but it also I think it's it's a democratic form in a lot of ways because it is about opening a space. It's not about telling you what to think. It's about leaving you your space and saying, okay, now fill it in. And I love that sort of style of humor, and that was the predominant style of humor during this this this. And so I think that was part of the political excitement in a lot of ways is that the humor helped um, with the sort of the democratic feeling um, of this election. Right, I, I have a slide to show you that's related to this. So if we can pull this you could pop it up. Um, we get a <laughs> lot of calls at the Lear Center from press who want to talk about, well, we hear that young people these days aren't, aren't reading the news and uh, they're, just, they're just watching Jon Stewart. And um, so we were very interested to find the results of this survey. Uh, it was a Pew Research project, but it wasn't done at the Lear Center. And, and one thing that they do, I think on an annual basis, is they do these, um, they uh, give these quizzes to people in order to find out how much they know about current affairs, and they look at knowledge levels. And here they looked at knowledge levels, and then they asked these same people where it was they'd like to get their news. And it turned out that the people with the highest knowledge level were the people who like to get their news from The Daily Show and The Colbert Report. And one of the reasons this makes sense is because the joke is so not funny if right. you don't know what the hell they're talking right. about. So you have to do your research, yeah. right? You have to already read the paper, already kind of know what's going on. And then you watch the comedy show and you get the joke. Now, it's not to say that it necessarily makes you a more sophisticated political thinker. In fact, I'd say just among my own sort of personal community of friends, I get a little irritated when my friends sort of pretend like the joke that Jon Stewart told last night is the political perspective that they have, as if they came up with that critique. <laughs> so it's sort of a shortcut to a sophisticated kind of political soundbite by sort of riffing off what smarter people who think about this all day are saying on your TV. So it's not necessarily, um, you know, the most beneficial and educational method of teaching people about politics, but engagement is crucial. There's a give and take. There's, there's knowledge that's required before the joke makes any sense at all. And so I thought this was a, a really interesting uh, data set. Plus, keep in mind CNN's rank, you know, ratings with young people went through the roof, doubled. And I think it was to get a narrative so they could, yes, follow the main story, but also so that when all that data got annotated at night in, in and those shows that they were in on the joke. And the ratings reflect that and voting reflects it. Voting was up huge. Can I, can I ask the panelists, including you, Henry, yeah. who got addicted to ticker on CNN? The political, the political, like it was updated every hour or two hours. Did anybody, was anybody else addicted to that? Just us? Never mind. Well, yeah, uh, but you know what, though? Look at the not, trade dress in that room. Right. You got John King on the giant iPod. Right, right. You got the ticker underneath them. But, I mean, but I, it's just and one of the things I think, I, it, for me, it became um, a soap opera. I mean, and it became this sort of constant, and my engagement was like it was a soap opera, and I got fascinated with it. I would have to update it every 35, 45 minutes, the political ticker. Um, and I do, I do wonder, again, is that engaging me or is this turning us into a soap opera? And I'm not, I, I haven't figured that out entirely. 
Well, soap operas are among, among the most engaging entertainment forms known to man. Definitely. And it is the best place to disseminate health information, just to let you know. Because <laughs> you got people five days a week, they can have very complicated diseases. And you can give them very complex <laughs> advice about it over six months period of time. <laughs> and then you can administer quizzes and find out they know more than your doctor friend does about chlamydia or whatever it was. So anyway, um, I don't think there's a contradiction there at all. By turning politics into melodrama, mm -hmm. into soap opera, you are deeply engaging people in a narrative. And it just has, so happens that the narrative's actually happening in the real world. Does the narrative then actually le le kind of jump from the screen or from uh, the living room out into the real world? Oh, yes. We do a lot of survey information on that as well for our health project in particular because we have to keep proving to the National Institutes of Health and the Centers for Disease Control that this stuff works. But also in the Zogby survey, we asked people, okay, well, what, what have you ever done based on what you've learned about politics in some fictional show that, that you watched? And it was amazing. A vast majority of the American public said they had done something written to a newspaper, made a donation. Mm -hmm. Among The poorest people were the most likely to say they had made a donation, and African Americans in particular said they volunteered in their neighborhood, they called somebody, and everybody said they talked to somebody about it. You see a compelling story, you ask somebody else, oh, did you see that? Mm -hmm. Did you know? So um, it's, it's, I think it's impossible to keep the entertainment experience contained within sure. the media. It, it always ends up leaking into real lives. So. Uh, the, 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 the last, I just want to make one point. Um, that the thing is, is content that seems really stupid and real base level. South Park, I've spent, I was at their studios on, on, uh, on, on Tuesday, and I've been looking over the show, always topical, always on the news, always with uh, a point of, point of view. So what looks like some uh, paper cutouts uh, of young preteen boys uh, shouting filth into the air actually is keeping you sort of on beam and in narrative. Yeah, it's actually, that's where the form really informs the content. It's because they're paper cut uh, animations that are really easy to put together in a week's time that they can actually talk about the news that happened over the last week. If they made beautiful animations, they'd be talking about the news that happened six months ago. So I'm going to open it up to the floor for questions in just a minute, but I'm going to ask one last question of the panelists to give you guys time to begin to formulate your questions and take advantage of my moderator's role to flash a couple of graphics of my own up here. This sort of, the question is designed to bring this up to the moment. That is, last week, New York Daily Post ran this cartoon depicting, uh, depicting the shooting of a chimpanzee who'd gone wild in its owner's home with the headline, they'll have to find someone else to write the next stimulus bill, which forced a begrudging and some now think uh, really not so much an apology from the New, New York Daily Post. As I was looking to find the cartoon, I looked online and found, in fact, uh, at least a, de a year's worth of cartoons that had directly connected Obama to, uh, to chimpanzees that are part of the Photoshop culture, the participatory culture that we've seen, where average citizens are taking images and manipulating them in, in various ways to sort of frame the issue. And then I went back even further and discovered this, which many of my liberal friends had circulated. You know, we probably have seen this on bulletin boards and refrigerators, which showed George Bush as a chimpanzee. And so I, I, I throw that open to be provocative, but also to think about what do we make of the controversy over this particular cartoon? And what does that tell us about, and what does this tell us about both the role of satire in politics and the role of, and the politics of participatory culture? <laughs> I, I didn't get it. I did not get the controversy. So I, I got the controversy. Yeah. I mean, the controversy is you can, you know, you can call me a bad driver, and it doesn't really matter. If you call a woman a bad driver, it has a host of connotations and restrictions and uh, and so on and so forth behind it. And so I think it was just it, it was this idea that humor could somehow be outside of a historical and political discourse, while at the same time, of course. Um, in order for it to be funny, it couldn't have been. And that's why I never bought the post. Well, we didn't, we, it was just a joke and so on and so forth. I think at some level they knew and they wanted to skate that line and see what would happen. And they wanted to be in some odd way, kind of be post-racial, um, but also garner the sort of 
uh, you know, the, the fruits of the, the racist discourse as well. So I, I thought it was, I could understand why people got upset. I thought it was a pretty bad cartoon, actually. Just Well, it was executed very yeah. poorly. Yeah. Well, comedy happens within a context always, and, and so that's one reason why it's, it's less okay to talk about uh, how bad an Asian driver is opposed yeah. to how bad a white male driver is. So there's this cultural context, and that cultural context is completely saturated with stereotypes. And so one of the things that I was doing after Henry said that he wanted to talk about this cartoon is I googled around for you know, racist cartoons about Obama. And I found several that were actually from last year. And it seemed to me that the emphasis was really on raci racist stereotypes that might be invoked for a black male that suggested that a black male was somehow superior to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Penis size, if I have to spell it out, was something that was mentioned or gestured to in several cartoons that I found. And I thought that was very interesting because it's one of those examples where you're utilizing a stereotype that's demeaning and, and of course it's reductive, but utilizing it in such a way that you're suggesting that this person, this person who is a member of a minority and is therefore a victim of racism and of certain <coughs> stereotypes, actually has it all over us. So it's, it's very interesting how these things can be invoked and have completely different valences, positive and negative. Well, I, I, I totally agree with what's said. I think to me what was interesting about finding the Photoshop images, including reminding myself of the George Bush one, is, is that we, we operate often as if greater participation meant a more civility in discourse, more diversity in discourse. It also means that these, what's taken for granted in the world of Photoshop collages mm -hmm. is probably can go much lower than would be acceptable on the pages of a newspaper. Mm -hmm. That these, cur these images that I'm showing circulate pretty freely on YouTube, and many of us were comfortable with it on our refrigerator door when it was about George Bush, but not about Obama. So it, it sort of, I think, those of us who are excited about participatory dimensions of the new media also have to be ethically aware of the kinds of insensitivity, the kinds of, you know, the debased levels of discourse that sometimes circulate in this participatory culture. I mean, that's, that's what discussion is about um, in a lot of ways. And probably the best thing that one can do is the, the good thing about the sort of the new media as opposed to the New York Post is the New York Post shows up on my street and what can I do? I can write a letter to them that may or may not be published. But anything that shows up on the web, I can actually produce something. I can comment below it. I can, you know, try to... You know, make my own counter one go viral and get more hits than theirs. That is, is that the forum is fundamentally different. And so, yes, this might, stuff might be just as atrocious, just as uncivil, perhaps more uncivil, but the forum in which we're working in um, allows for a discussion around that as opposed to the broadcast model. Those of us who work at large media outlets always thought of the web as one more publishing opportunity when in fact Jeff Jarvis and others reminded us it's actually a way for you to listen and hear it. I grok that and I thought that's great. And then I started to occasionally veer into political issues and the level of discourse. I mean, historically, it's always assumed that the people on the right weaned on talk radio, mouth breathers that they are, are the foulest most, that they'll come at you with all men. <coughs> I noticed no difference in level of discourse according to political opinion and the rawness of it that's disrespectful of us, uh, of it. And I'm not even a woman because at our paper, if you're a woman, it would always start with your physique. It would always start with your body parts and before they even got to the, and, and so it's, it's great that we can hear from our, our audience. It's sometimes appalling what they really want to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, on that note, we'll hear what our audience really wants to talk about. So prepare I, to be appalled. Uh. I had one thing, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, uh, a friend sent this to me, and I just found it so deeply compelling, and I think it fits in very nicely with, with your, book, your book project and what you're saying about dreams and politics, and, and really engaging with political discourse in popular culture, having a... a <laughs> writing blogs about it, making videos and remix videos and stuff. It's a way of, um, uh, of creating a story where you have a role in it, yeah. right? Yeah. And it's participatory. 
Well, one thing I was fascinated by was this blog uh, blog entry on the New York Times site. It was about it was called Dreams of Obama. Did you see that? Mm -hmm. And it was the blogger. I can't remember who it was. Said that her friends started mentioning to her that I've been dreaming about Obama, <laughs> and I like Michelle, but now I feel kind of guilty. <laughs> So, so people have been, and so she started collecting all these dreams about Obama. And the, oh, the dreams were so fascinating. Sometimes they were sexual. Sometimes they were fraught with all this angst because I really like Michelle. Why am I doing this to her? But sometimes it was Obama's taking out my trash and he's cleaning out my house. I think it's metaphorical. <laughs> and then you, you know, you post this online and it becomes a part of a sort of political consciousness that that's deeply subconscious and it's. It's great storytelling, and it's it's really deeply affecting the lives that we're leading. So I just want to throw that one out there. <laughs> okay, so over here first. Um, in in terms, uh, I'm in sympathy with with some of what I think was being said about Brand Obama and sort of you know reading anything in, into it you want to. Um, the th things that were in a way most impressive to me about Obama as a candidate, as a as a uh, presented uh, candidate. Uh, we're in broadcast television, and there are two m moments that I want to mention. Uh, one was in one of the debates where he was being attacked by Hillary, and what I w saw on the screen, I, un I thought, was someone taking in the attack, sort of watching him process this attack in a kind of, and his, his, what might have been a, 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 an inclination to lash back but sort of processing it, controlling it, and then responding from another place. And I was impressed with that, whether I like Obama politically or, or not. And I'm not that, that impressed with Obama in some ways. The other moment was when what I took to be a sort of feigned gesture at the end of a, a subsequent debate, I think it was, when he got up and kind of went to pull, to sh show th that he was interested in pulling Hillary's chair away from her at the end of the debate to sort of hold her chair for her. And what I, part of what I wonder is, is the first instance possibly, does any of you think it's an example of someone with their consultants understanding the nature of television as a medium and understanding the importance, the need to pre be present a cool kind of uh, uh, presentation? and whatever you might have to say about the other example. And also, I'm not sure I quite understand how you can manipulate or, and I know this was just a off the cuff use of a word, trick people with integrity. It seems to me, you know, you might have a good message, you might want to draw people in to hear a good message. I was sort of in sympathy with bringing up the example of Bush. Um, but I just don't understand how manipulating people is, is something that's done with any kind of integrity, even if your message you might think is a good one. Yeah, I, I just want to speak to that quickly. Um, two things. One is, I actually think that don't underestimate Obama's training since he, the age of one in um, being surveyed and looked at. And he's a black man growing up in a, you know, a non-black country. And that when he walks into a room, people look at him and have judgments about him. And he's learned to look at himself. I mean, this is what Du Bois writes about with double consciousness. And so I think that that studied cool that people saw had a lot to do with growing up black in America. Um, and it can go one way or the other. And this is the way it went with him. Um, but going back to the idea of manipulation and how do you have integrity within manipulation, I'll give you one example, um, which is Las Vegas. Um, not the gambling casinos. Um, but that Las Vegas is a fake and everybody knows it's a fake. That is, it manipulates you. Uh, or rather, it is a spectacle. It is attracts you. It draws you in. But no one who goes to New York, New York, in Las Vegas thinks they're actually going to New York. Um, that is, is that you can have a sort of a spectacular um, uh, portrayal. You can have a stylistic portrayal. But all at the same time, be very open about what you're doing. And this is the difference between something like George Bush landing on the USS Abraham Lincoln, which is selling a fantasy as the truth, um, versus presenting a good story. Um, and presenting a, uh, a narrative or a brand that people actually want to be part of. He, we're not saying that he's actually fake. Um, we're saying he's learned how to package himself, sell himself, and be an identity, and to be an image in a lot of ways. And I think to a certain extent we've, we all do that now, and he's just particularly good at it. I, th I think it's an, uh, just a splendid question because 
when I, I remember the first instance you're talking about, and when he was processing, was he also processing what you and I would think? Doing, they think that I think that she thinks that, <laughs> what, was he, because it's, it's, I've seen the guy up close and it's hard to sort of overestimate the amount of processing power at work there is, is and I think a lot of it comes from what, what, what Steve was talking about and also an awareness going forward that at some point this is going to be played out in a public context. The other thing, and this is less to that point, but these exemplars over and over, the ability of time and platform shifts. So if you came in on Monday and I worked with you and you said, did you see Obama really thinking it through before he, and I would say, no, but I'm going to go look at it right now. And I think that's something completely different. It was the ability to catch up time and again, get narrative. The water cooler was this movable time and platform shifted thing where we could all be in on the joke, we could all be in on, and it gave us an opportunity to have, I think, a deeper conversation along the way. Okay, question over here. Hi, I'm Ian Condry, and I teach in comparative media studies. Um, I, very interesting, really wonderful discussion on a lot of levels. Uh, one of the things I wanted to uh, push on was the image of popular culture. You know, what is this popular culture? And one of the things I, I've been getting from the discussion is that a lot of it seems to be about representations or a way of thinking about individuals either as leaders who are branded in certain ways, as chimps or as a cool rap aficionados, um, or in terms of the kind of individualized consumer, right? The, the red groups, the red consumers, the blue consumers, the purple, purple consumers as a kind of l large mass, I guess, basically. And I think one of the things that I found so interesting about the Obama phenomenon is that it started to draw attention to this middle level of politics where it was more about small groups networking, right? A kind of collective engagement uh, that was less about the representations as it was about facilitating the flow that then got people to feel involved and got people in, in kind of small groups. Uh, I think of it as a kind of jazz democracy, right? You have these people improvising on different themes but in small groups. Um, and so, you know, and, and some of the things, you know, the, the, uh, you know, this distinction between, you know, news, what happens in documentaries and talk shows, and then that's not pop culture and the other stuff is, I, I'm not sure about those kind of distinctions because if pop culture is the things that we talk about and that if we watch Colbert with the knowledge of what really happens in the news, then that distinction doesn't really hold. And, and why it doesn't hold is because it's about how we talk about it with each other. And that there it doesn't matter whether we learned it from Colbert or we learned it from a column in the New York Times. And, and so I think, you know, that, that I guess that's the, the level I, I'm sort of curious uh, to hear more about. And that's the, the conversation, you know, the word mobilization came up. And I think maybe mobilize is, is one way to think about it. Um, Right, collective engagement, uh, and that the, there is this kind of middle level of politics. I mean, it's the thing that's been so frustrating about the whole meltdown is that it's either we need great leaders to somehow pull us out of this, or we should just keep spending, you know, as consumers. And it seems to me it, it's this middle level. What are corporations? How do they work? You know, what are what are our responsibilities as as a nation of consumers or as people who live in certain ways? How do we participate in these smaller groups? Uh, that really seems what to be what Obama suggested or showed was out there, but it seems we still have our discourse still isn't caught up uh, to find out a way to talk about that. Thank you. No, you, no, 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 you, no, you, no, no. Okay, David. <laughs> <laughs> I thought this was perfect for you. Yeah, he, he said mobilization, so it's on you, my brother. But it ended on, okay, I would agree. If we weren't talking about popular culture, I'd say one of the things that I, as a political activist, really admired about the Obama campaign was that they were able, through their networking, to reactivate sort of civic society and civil society. And so you could actually, this is, you know, you could actually plug in at all sorts of levels and be an activist for a day. And one of the things I learned as a community organizer is the first thing you do when someone comes to a meeting is you give them a job. Because once they actually complete that task, no matter how small it is, they are now part of your campaign. And so one of the things they did was build 
to, you know, to expand the term, a culture of organizing. And one of the things that people have been talking about in my circle of political organizers is, what do we do with this culture of organizing now? Is Obama going to use it? Or have all these people that used to think of themselves as consumers of politics now think of themselves as producers of politics? How can we tap into that? Because that's when social <clears throat> movements and organizations explode, when people who don't think of themselves as politicos start to actually act as politicos, because they bring in all of this new stuff. You saw in the civil rights movement, you saw it during ACT UP, and that's when these things explode into all sorts of new and exciting <clears throat> formations, which us tired old politicos would have never thought of. That's what I thought you were going to talk about. Okay. And I, I read some article that, that you wrote recently about how powerful these small networks are, uh, in particular because it's a way in which groups of people can sort of can sort of share a sense of being celebrities, yeah. right? They become known to other people, right? Yeah. We always think of it as a mass audience and one celebrity and everybody's looking for their seven minutes of fame or the seven seconds of fame. But when you have these really tight, aggressive, and, uh, and mobilized little networks, everybody becomes a kind of celebrity within them. And so I think that's another way in which popular culture and this whole notion of celebrity becomes injected into participatory culture and into the political process in, in I think, a very functional fashion. Yeah. The, the, the ability to customize by geography, among other things, I think led itself to a really substantial online, offline response. Part of what people need to know, this isn't some crunchy, progressive imperative. People look at a mega church in Houston and say, how can the needs, the spiritual needs of 4,800 people be satisfied by this one guy? Of course not. They've self-assigned into prayer groups. They meet where there, there, there are sub leaders, and that mm -hmm. they, they are, um, and everybody gets a role to play. And the amount of sort of feedback about not only do you exist, but you are a good person. Mm -hmm. You're trying. You're, you're, you're involved on a very retail level. And I mean, Obama <coughs> has always this is the Chicago in him, but I've watched him work a room of really drunk, entitled white people and, 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 and watched him work the retail aspect of it. And I do think that he came up with a campaign organism that replicated the ability to not just suck things from people, but to give them things as well, to give them a psychic return for well, involvement. One of the things that I argue in convergence culture is we've been learning through our play skills we're gonna acquire, we're gonna apply to more serious purposes as we find the cause that drives us. So I think one I would argue that pop culture consumption today is almost never individual. It's always social. It's always being through networks in one way or another. The fan communities and gamer communities have more and more become large scale collective bargaining units on behalf of media consumers. And as they do so, they're teaching their rank and file how to act politically. And so I'm very interested in sort of proto-political behaviors like now. So how do people quickly mobilize to write letters to keep a television show on the air or to repel a cease and desist letter that's thrown out them? And how do we move from those tactics into new forms of political activism? And I'd suggest that most of what I saw in the Obama campaign, I recognized from fan cultures of one sort or another. The myth of Obama as fan in chief is running through the communities. I regularly study uh, the fact that he reads Harry Potter novels to his kids, that he can reference YouTube videos, that he knows how to do the Vulcan salute. There's a whole mythology about <laughs> Obama as geek fanboy right. yes, there that is. has taken root in the society, which made him an appealing candidate for the shock troops who've been learning how to navigate through social networks to achieve proto-political ends, which now are becoming political as, they, as their tension turns from the cultural sphere toward more traditional politics. And the, the activa activation of those various, various verticals of interest, it often involves, you know, somebody blew a whistle none of the rest of us could hear, but he is a whistleblower in chief. He's somebody who can make a noise that, that various verticals, and, and he's, he's, he's able to sort of customize and segment his message and send it out, you know, radiate a message to where pe a lot of people feel he belongs to them. 
And they're all very different people. And, and what's different, I think, is that we're used to thinking of consuming as this sort of passive activity. And then, of course, there's this you know, moment where people start saying, well, it's not necessarily passive because we b bestow meanings on what we consume and so on and so forth. But now, because of technology, particularly in the media sphere, we're rarely just consumers. We're actually consumer producers all the time. Right. Um, and what I think that, that Obama tapped into is not just sort of age-old organizing techniques, which he would have learned in the streets of Chicago as a community organizer, but also this fundamental understanding that when people consume a message, they want to produce it as well. They want to make it go <laughs> viral. They want to put their own little spin on it. Um, you know, they called it snowflake organizing within their world, which every snowflake was different. So you would take in Obama's message, and then you'd reproduce it. But they allowed for a lot of sort of, um, how do I say this? Uh, they allowed people to, to make it their own. Um, and they never did the clamping down and policing on the videos, not that they could have, um, and on the message, not that they could have, but they didn't even try. They realized, you know, the thousand flowers bloom is going to work for us as long as we got that 30-minute infomercial. And I mean, Henry and others have written about what customization will do, the ability to just put a little top spin on, yeah. just to touch it and yeah. get it moving a certain way. Okay, over here. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I'm not quite sure, Henry, what new media you used to discern uh, what the question was that I was going to ask, but thank you for laying the groundwork for it. <laughs> um, I'd like to change the perspective a little bit. If pop culture is uh, ephemeral and fleeting, if we uh, enjoyed you know, discussing the success of the new media and politics, let's go four years in the future. Will there be a Twitter? Will there be a Facebook? What's in the pipelines now that are gonna substantially change the paradigm for 2012? Henry? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, on my crystal ball that they issued when I became an MIT faculty member is busted this week. Uh, uh, you know, I think the interesting thing is I, I, was, I wrote <coughs> completed convergence culture when the last <coughs> campaign was ending. Convergence <coughs> culture, doesn't include any reference to Web 2.0, doesn't include any reference to YouTube, doesn't include any reference to Second Life, doesn't include any reference to Twitter, has a passing reference at the very last minute to iTunes. So all of that has happened since the last presidential election. And I'm modest enough to admit to you that I didn't see it, most of that coming. The logic of what, what that book described would account for all of that, the specifics are all, you know, we're on the horizon, but we don't know yet what they're going to be. So I think we can think logically where the culture is going to move us, but I think it's none of us could tell you what the technologies four years from now or the platforms four years from now are actually going to be that enable that politics to take place. But if you looked four years ago, you would have seen the beginnings of satire as a political tool. You would have seen signs of fan-based movements and politics. You would have seen a number of the things we talked about here today, the lessons of Joe Trippi and Howard Dean impacted Obama in ways that you know, we could have predicted, but we can't, what we can't predict is what's the platform, I think. Yeah. I don't think you can overestimate how radical it could be. If you look at this slide, I had no Facebook. No, you know what I mean? How rapidly things could change. You could have a candidate in 012 say, yeah, I got a media strategy. Let's not engage them at all. Zero. We're going to broadcast out we're using our own media, and we're going, to, we're, we're going to build constituency, and we don't want third-party annotation of anything we do. Could be as radical as that. Yeah. Uh, David put up leading reference to Walter Benjamin up there. And you know, Walter Benjamin's seminal article on um, Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, it ends in this conclusion, which says essentially reproduction has changed the ball game for politics. And it's either going to lead to fascism or it's going to lead to a democratic communism. And he's holding it open because he doesn't know which way it's going to go. Either the idea, the image is going to become reorified, re-brought together, and given a singular meaning under fascism, or people are going to have a discussion about the meaning of images and so on and so forth. And I think that's exactly what we have to look at it now. Is you can look at the logic of what's happening, but also understand that there's always agency there, that it can split one way or split the other way. Okay, over here. 
Hi, thanks for a great panel. Uh, my name is Madeline. I'm a graduate student in the Comparative Media Studies Department. I have a question, I guess, Joanna, mainly for you, but also expand it outward. Um, what role does age play in the, the sort of preferences, the sort of def definitions of each of those groups? Because it seemed to me that their, you know, age would be a factor and sort of expand it out. What role does, does age play in the formation of popular culture? Is it really driven by the sort of younger half of people or um, also other sort of factors that might, that might influence? how this popular culture is getting made. Sure, sure. Well, I can give you a little demographic portrait of each one of the groups if, if that's of, of interest. And the oldest group was which one? Oh, it was the Reds. Yeah. They were also the wealthiest, and they were the group within which a majority never graduated from college. So they're making <laughs> the most money, but they weren't the most educated. They were most likely married. They were most likely living in rural areas. Um, most of them, a majority of them, described themselves as born again. 72% were registered Republican. They were the least racially diverse group, and they were the only group where men actually outnumbered women. So absolutely demographics drive the kinds of preferences that you saw up on the screen. For blues, they were the youngest group, the most educated, the most urban, the most racially and religiously diverse. They were 79% Democrats, 18% registered independents. Uh, they were as likely to describe themselves as moderate as they were to say that they were liberal or progressive. This was in a separate part of the survey where we asked them to self-identify. They were female, um, most likely. They were single or in a civil union, and most of them lived in the center Great Lakes region. Okay, one more. Uh, purples. <laughs> Most haven't graduated from college. Half identify as born again. They were most likely to be divorced, widowed, or separated. They were female, majority. Large city or suburbs, they live in the east, the largest group of them. Uh, Middle-aged and middle class, more likely to make less than 35K per household. A majority voted for Kerry <coughs> in 2004. And 45% Democrat, 24% Republican, 31% Independent. Maybe just a, a follow-up question. I, I, maybe I don't know enough about sort of statistics and, and how these sort of numbers play out, but it seems to me that there are like, I don't know, sort of what, what kinds of consequences will those groupings have? Because it seems like they're sort of little bits of, there's like a percentage <coughs> of a percentage of a percentage. And sort of how does that lead to any sort of consensus? Well, I guess what was important to us was just trying to figure out where the ideological divides really are in this country before we, would get, we could get to the work of the survey and the research, which was to figure out whether there was any correlation between political ideology and entertainment preferences. And we had no idea where the fault lines were going to be, how many groups we were going to discover, how coherent they were, whether there were going to be coherent groups at all. But it turned out that there were th these three chunks and it was very interesting to take a look at what each one of those chunks really meant. And the, the pressure on us from the press was really to figure out who the middle group was. Because the way in which we generally talk about politics in the United States is between conservative and liberal, between Democrat and Republican. And we have a very vague notion of what those people in between might be like and who they are. Well, it turns out it's one in four Americans if you're looking at our ideological index. And who are they? <laughs> what are they thinking? This, is, this was something that, that we wish to answer. And we've done different um, uh, sub-analyses of the data. In 2007 in particular, we did a big New York Times Magazine piece that was about female moderates. Um, the moderate group was the largest majority female of all the three groups, and we were very curious about who they were as a demographic. And so that's the value of it, really, is just trying to figure out where the fracture lines are in this country and ideologically how we sort of cluster together in groups. Because just looking at, at party registration and looking at the way people identify themselves politically is much less predictive, actually, of what their ideological beliefs are and also less predictive of what their entertainment preferences are, we found. If, if you're talking about a youthful cohort and what they might be capable of, in terms of going forward. They're right now tipping over mainstream media culture 
um, and their, 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 their influence is profound, is self-producing, self-consuming, self-editorializing. They're dictating terms uh, uh, going forward. So it is, it, you cannot underestimate what's going to happen in terms of the political process because they can move as a cohort and express needs in a way that previous generations did not imagine in the 60s if those guys had a desktop like these kids uh, 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 had. And keep in mind, keep in mind that people uh, uh, your age, now in addition to all these amazing, seemingly transparent um, uh, networked behaviors, now you vote too. So it's like, if I'm running nationally, it's just like, I'm gonna do what Obama did, which is, is, is start young and, 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 and work out first. Because the amount of asymmetries that the younger cohorts present in media, in media terms, and, and the thing is, is people say, well, how did Brand Obama get built without uh, um, wobbling off course? Well, it was self-cleaning oven. Anytime he did, you know, the, 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 the communication goes uh, 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 both ways. And boy, if he really screws up in the White House, is he ever going to hear about it? When he screwed up on NAFTA in the campaign, he, this huge actualized network jumped down his throat. And it's, it's, it's call and response. It's not the polarity goes uh, uh, both ways. Well, the, the Republican Party has been trying to pump up Bobby Jindal as the, the Republican Obama. We saw a good <laughs> example of his media <laughs> skills this past week. Uh, do you think there are candidates who can learn the lessons of Obama? Uh, they haven't found him yet. I mean, that what, what you know, uh, poor Bobby Janelle. I mean, that was just terrible. It was just, <laughs> oh, it, it really was, you know, is there, the, they don't have any ideas. They're exhausted. Um, it reminds me of the Democratic Party in 1976, you know, through 19, uh, <laughs> through the most recent election. And I don't know. They certainly don't seem to have any anybody. Um, they seem to have sort of retreads of, of um, you know, Democrats, essentially, um, which is what the Democratic Party did um, remind people for about 20 years. So I don't see anybody in the wings. Uh, Sarah Palin is not, you know, I, 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 I don't. I think she might be charismatic, um, but I don't think she has the sort of savvy and the ability to, to work across platforms. She can only work in one way, which is a prepared speech, and, um, and perhaps in public speaking to an audience which agrees with her. But she's not good across platform, and Obama really is good across platform. Um, it would be also interesting to see that, you know, if the rest of the Democratic Party can come on board to this. I don't know if they can. His team certainly can, but I'm not sure the rest can. Okay. Question over here. Uh, hi, my name's uh, Rohit Sakuja. I'm from the uh, a researcher in the Industrial Performance Center here uh, at MIT. Um, I wanted to ask about, uh, I mean, it seems like one of the things that I keep hearing, I you know, sort of kept hearing both, you know, during the um, you know, pre-election as well as post-election about Obama was, wow, it's so nice to have an, a per, an inspiring person in this office, or so nice to have an inspiring person running for this office, and so nice to have an a, a inspiring person then in the office. And wanted to, I just 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 wanted to to get your sort of collective reactions as to is that something that is happens to be an important aspect of our culture right now, and is reflected <laughs> in. In, in other ways, particularly in the in, you know in terms of the type of entertainment that people are that that, that, that people are are are, are um, in you know looking for the, and the type of entertainment that's popular and I mean do we see that sort of inspiration theme is this is this a sort of temporal thing or does it happen to is it something that we sort of see throughout time and just so happens that here's a guy who can actually really do this. Um, and curious if we see that sort of inspiration theme reflected in other in other areas of pop culture. I think it's very typical in sports, in particular, where people have these idols. You know, they they have a body like ours, but they can do the most amazing things with them. It's it's just incredibly inspiring, and and you love it when you find somebody who's different enough to 
to somehow transcend what seems like all the human fallibility that, that you're surrounded by. And if you too play the sport that you watch them play on TV, you're just in shock. You're like, how do they do that? And I think that's the kind of feeling that a lot of people have about Obama as well, that under all of this media pressure and constant surveillance that he just doesn't screw up very much. It's like, how did that happen? So I think it's very important to have icons. It's, it's part of what celebrity culture celebrates. And it can be aspirational for everyone. But it's, I don't think it's in any way new. And I think it certainly depends on, on people with huge vats of talent. And those don't come around all the time. There's not many of them. Um, I do think that um, let the economy stall for a couple more months. Let them uh, continue to be unable to get a commerce, commerce secretary let his uh, decisions in Iraq come to haunt him. And mainstream media and the viral media will demonstrate his feet of clay with enormous alacrity, and his exalted status will dissipate like that. And you, you'll see a clicking point. I do think, to your question, less, not, get, not getting into whether US foreign policy has frittered away enormous equities we had in the world, um, which is sort of a tendentious way of putting it, but you know what I mean. Just apart from that, George Bush as a hood ornament on American culture people had become uncomfortable with because he was inarticulate, because he, his, his great sin in terms of world leadership probably had less to do with, with significant strategic errors and more to do with the fact that the guy couldn't talk, couldn't communicate, and didn't represent us well as a people. And there was just a, a cultural reflex, I think. And I think that was part of the great hunger of, uh, uh, for Obama is, and you saw people very much purpled out who were totally into him, mostly because he could talk, mm -hmm. mostly because he could communicate. They're buying into the semiotics as opposed to the practical decisions that he makes. I would agree, I, I would agree, disagree with David, and I hope I'm right, um, but you might be right. I actually think that like Ronald Reagan and like FDR, that actually uh, the world can go to hell in a handbasket, and uh, Barack Obama will still have high approval ratings. Um, I think that he is at the top of his game. I think the sports metaphor is, is, is an apt one. It, it, it is like watching an athlete just at the top of his game. He has unerring instincts. Um, he can pull what should be a disaster the Jeremiah Wright thing and turn it into a victory. He understands pacing the whole stimulus package. When the mainstream media did go after him, when the Republican noise machine turned up, he did what he had always done in his debates, but on a longer time scale, he let it go, let it go, let it go. When the news cycle started to shift, he dominated the game for the last three days. I mean, the guy is really, really good. He also went in Iraq, I mean, in Kuwait, shooting basketball with the troops. He made a swish shot from outside the three-point line. Um, you know, there's a Republican conspiracy theory that he's a Manchurian candidate. At that moment, I was thinking there might be some credence to that, because <laughs> no one can do that with the whole world's media watching him. OK, over here. I'd like to provoke a little further discussion about style and aesthetics, and that I think that they actually are political action, not that they precede it or that they surround it, but that the creation of aesthetics and style is a political action. And the thing that has inspired me to think of that is the increased awareness about lobbying and the influence of lobbying on our elected officials, that what may appear as cold rationality is in itself a style. And it's a style that, it, that tries to disappear into political action. That political action is a certain way of speaking and being. And I actually believe that George Bush appealed on a, on a certain level to this for eight years, that his speaking style did represent many people, and people were very happy that the way that he kind of challenged a certain coldness and rationality with warmth and emotion. And <laughs> Obama is actually taking the Bush project a little bit further in sense of style and performance of politics. Um, if, if you're saying, is there, a, is there a politics actually embedded in style and aesthetics? I, I, I think, yeah, yeah. I think yes. A, uh, an opposition between style and politics, oh, yes. but that style is politics. 
Well, I think that I definitely don't think there's an opposition between the two. I think that style definitely is politics, and within a certain way of appearing, with a way of speaking, and so on and so forth, carries with it a whole baggage, a whole way of seeing the world, a way of arranging what comes into our senses and what's left out of our senses, and so on. So I actually think that's why style has to be thought of politically all the time, and one can't say, you know, one, that we don't do style, we just do content, because of course that in itself is a style, so you always have to be thinking that over and over. Just, just quickly, the, the, um, is Billy wear uh, fame as a loose garment, which is something our culture has come to ad admire, is it gives him, he starts with style points. I mean, I was, I was in uh, Denver and way, way up uh, in the stadium. And they did that drum roll that they do at a big national convention. The man is coming. He's going to be here over and over. Everybody comes out and talks about this guy, this guy, this guy. And then when he comes out, and I'm there as a reporter. I'm not there as an American citizen. But there's a difference. Um, uh, but, but after this big drum roll, the fact that, that a black guy comes walking out there, I was just like, oh, a little windy up here. Uh, there's <laughs> stuff flying into my eyes. And what I was reacting to is not Obama's going to be a president. It's no matter what anybody has ever said about this country, we as a people, regardless of what he does, can access the angel of our better nature. And to that extent, his ability to take that great weight and not let him crush him and not let it become, you know, he, he ran away from race throughout, but we all pinned so many hopes on him. And the fact that it didn't bring him to his knees or that he didn't go there rhetorically, I just think is there, there was a grace to it that is you know, putting away the three-pointer, Jordan at the top of his game. It's like, how do you know that? That, that? that we were already, as a people, doing that work and assigning that meaning, and he didn't need to pound that nail in. That's, I think, part of what he had going. I guess I was, I was just going to say that there is so much substance in style. I think a lot of us would like to think that style is just that surface. It's the bell and whistle. It's, it's somehow divorced from what's, what it's packaging. That's never been the case. It's always historical. It's always embedded in a cultural context. It communicates volumes. And people who are able to understand the meaning of a style are the people who can usually best communicate with an audience. And I think that's one thing that Obama just has an amazing skill at. And I think it's one reason that so many people has talked about his, have talked about his campaign in terms of brand Obama. Because that's exactly what branding is about. It's, it's, it's creating a space within a, a retail consumer market that is owned by one thing, right? It has an identity, it has a content, it has substance. And it's ephemeral, it's fake, it's constructed, it's a few colors, it's a swoosh, it's, a, it's a whatever, whatever it may be composed of is beside the point. It's the meaning that it conjures that's really important. And so I think that's, that's one reason that it, it's just completely specious to try to claim that we can somehow uh, revive politics by taking the entertainment out of it, by taking the style and the bells and whistles and, and the fun parties and the carnival. <coughs> it's just not gonna happen. Okay, time for one last question. Uh, you talked a fair bit about the role of, of comedy in this past election. I wanted to um, get your thoughts a little bit on the role of drama and particular uh, some TV drama in sort of perhaps laying the groundwork or in helping to define in people's minds a sense of what's possible and what's normal. I'm thinking of things like on the West Wing, the character of Santos who was specifically modeled on Obama back when he was still a local politician in Illinois, young, progressive, non-white candidate who actually gets elected president. Um, the role of, of a program like Commander in Chief with Gina Davis uh, becoming the president as a result of having been selected as the running mate for an elderly maverick Republican candidate. Um, 
the black president on 24, that these, this sort of continuous week after week set of images that people are exposed to helps to sort of lay the groundwork for, so that even though we've never actually had a black president before, the notion of having a black president or a woman president is not quite as jarring or as surprising or as strange to people because they've lived with it in that, in that medium over that length of time. And not just, not just the, the sort of demographic factors, but also uh, the West Wing at a time when people's opinions of both the presidency and the Congress were sort of at an all-time low of at least reminding people of the notion that it's at least theoretically possible to have political leaders who are both intelligent and well-motivated um, to help uh, keep people away from just becoming totally cynical about politics and reminding them of, of what's possible. How, how much of a role do you think those kinds of images have played in I mean, I, what's coming I think I think it's immense. I mean, I, I always joke that West Wing was, you know, the exile, uh, the good government in exile. Um, uh, but I think that it, it's dangerous to think, and I'm not saying it's wrong, but dangerous to think that it actually created a mindset which was then going to be accepting of a black president, a thoughtful president, so on and so forth. Um, I actually think it also worked the other way, which is why that was successful, why the producers thought they could get away with it, why the money actually was given to it and so on and so forth, had a lot to do with a correct reading of the desires of the American population. I mean, one of the good things about living in a free market capitalist society is when things don't tap into a public psyche, they only last one season. And so if you got a couple of seasons under your belt, you know, if I was a politician right now, I'd be watching House every single night <laughs> trying to figure out what's going on there. Of course, if we follow that logic, Steve, it explains why Obama be beat Clinton since Commander-in-Chief didn't last a point. <laughs> actually, actually, I talked to the executive producer of 24, who was a big Democrat, and he's like, oh, people are always making fun of our show, saying that it's so conservative and it's so retrograde. He's like, we helped get Obama elected. But he said, if I had been able to get the show on the air, um, you know, before the actors strike, he thinks Hillary would have won because of Cherry Jones' portrait of a president on 24, which is just now running. So, <laughs> well, I, I agree with the basis of the question, which we as a culture have been doing these calisthenics for a long, long time and getting ready. So, well put. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, if the audience will join me in thanking the panelists. Thank you very much.